Well, hey there, everyone. It's Sue McLaurin here. For this episode, we are joined by makeup artist Mia Connor. So thank you so much for joining us today, Mia. Thank you. Um, now, just to let you know, for anyone who doesn't know who Mia is and all about her, Mia has always had a love affair with art and her creative flair was apparent at quite a young age. She was always drawing and always wanted to be an artist when she grew up. But she did leave her dream for a while because she thought it would be an impossibly hard career path. But she later stumbled into a different art form, the world of makeup, totally by accident. In 2003, she booked her first makeup course with Napoleon in Sydney, just because she wanted to learn to do her own makeup. Realising that she was on to something, in 2005, she decided to chase her dreams and moved interstate to the Gold Coast to study under Academy Award winning makeup artist Peter Frampton, where she completed her diploma. She worked at MAC briefly and freelanced until she got busy enough to open her own studio in 2007, The Makeup Bar. In 2015, Mia took out the title of Makeup Artist of the Year for the Australian Beauty Industry Awards. And that's definitely, I think, been one of her biggest achievements to date. And then in the past few years, Mia has added educator to her resume. And she now travels interstate and overseas regularly, teaching other makeup artists her signature looks and helps them with running more successful business as well. She's particularly great with helping artists with creating content for their social media. So more recently, she's traveled throughout Australia and globally, and her education has taken her to such places as London, Lima, Croatia, Dublin, Glasgow, Lithuania, New York, Miami, LA, and Connecticut. It's almost like, where haven't you been, Mia? So yeah. <laughs> Wrapping up the frequent flyers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Great for those uh, party trips to Bali, I'm sure. <laughs> so, well, that's just a little bit of a brief introduction. And what I really love about your story, I think, is, you know, that you kind of came into being a makeup artist by accident. Now, I remember those days, you know, you were on the Gold Coast, I was in Cairns at the time, and then I moved to Brisbane. But it was in the pre-social media days, so things were quite a lot different there. But what I really remember about you then is like how hard working you were and what it actually took for you in the beginning. And, you know, I'm sure it's very easy for people who look at your career now and think, oh, my gosh, you know, she's got this amazing career. She's this amazing makeup artist. But often we kind of don't really see what it took back in the early days. So... Can you tell us a little bit about what it was like for you back in those early days? Yeah, I feel like I almost burnt myself out, to be honest, like um, in those early days. And I would never want to work at that um, like pace ever again. So I started out, my background is I worked in law firms. So I was a paralegal for about 10 years. And then, like you said, I did the Napoleon makeup course just to learn how to do my own makeup. And then I really loved it because I liked art. So it kind of went hand in hand. And then I guess the way that I started, I, um, I mean, you mentioned that we didn't really have social media back then, but we kind of did, we had MySpace, which is, mm it wasn't obviously designed as for the use of what we are using Instagram for more of a business and Facebook business purpose now. So, but I was using MySpace um, as my online platform back then to um, basically just showcase my work rather than I saw it as an opportunity rather than just to have it as like a social networking site. So um, yeah, I was doing a lot of photo shoots. I collabed with um, a couple of different photographers where we'd offer like packages together. Like I would offer a hair and makeup pa makeup package and they would obviously do the photo shoot. And um, the Gold Coast back then, and I guess my work back then was very like glam, glam. It was very different. It was very like men's magazine style. Um, I did a lot of men's mag work. And obviously the style of that is very like full glam um, hair and makeup. So we, I got a lot of my work by collabing um, through with other, um, with photographers um, like that. And also I was doing my weddings um, and just events, all that special event makeup 
um, and I opened my salon. It took me about two years of working at that pace of, because bear in mind, I was still working in my other job, mm. Monday to Friday, nine to five. So my a normal week for me would be me, um, you know, sometimes doing like getting up at 3 a.m. and doing hair and makeup in my kitchen um and for the model to go off and do one of their bikini photo shoots like when the sun was coming up so then I'd go to my day job for you know nine to five and then in the evenings I actually um had a job funnily enough working in a strip club doing um the dancers makeup like five nights a week which was actually a really good money maker for me because they usually in clubs like that the girls just pay them the makeup artist sits in the toilet, which I wasn't. <laughs> um, and the girls will just pay them, the makeup artists themselves like $10 for some, a set of eyes or something. Whereas I was on an hourly rate um, for, with the club, no matter what. Right. So that was a good, um, a good little gig. And on the weekends, I would be doing weddings, events, photo shoots. So it was pretty much like a seven day um, mm. a week circuit that I was doing solidly for like two years until I literally ran out of all of my annual leave and um, sick pay and all the jobs kept coming in. I just, there was no more leave, like time for me to take off work to go and do these jobs. And I started having to say no to really good makeup jobs. So I had to kind of make the decision of what am I doing? Like, am I going to stick doing how it is or do I take the challenge and like, quit my day job and then go full-time freelance. So not only did I quit my job to just freelance, I went straight in and opened a salon. So I hopped from my job straight into um, renting a salon space um, where I knew that makeup at that level that I was at is usually um, an event based and orientated like situation where makeup is happening ma mainly on the weekends and stuff for events. So I had to fill my time during the week. So I implemented spray tanning services and I did mm. hair extensions and I had um, a brow technician come in and rent a space off me. So I basically utilized the space as much as I could and made it financially viable and worked it as hard as I could. So yeah, so that's how I began. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's a really interesting point that you touched on there is that having to make that shift from your full-time job yeah. to going into freelancing. And I know, you know, there's a lot of, lot of artists that I talk to and I'm sure yourself as well, that they are in that still doing that job and they yeah. want to make that shift. Um, did you, had you saved up a lot of money to, you know, to support yourself throughout that transition mm. or? I can't remember back then. I mean, that was like 12 years ago now. I mean, yeah. I was always, I've always been very good with money. Like um, I would always have money for something if something happened. So mm. I can't remember if I had a lot saved up, but I also had the benefit of when I opened my salon, obviously you need to fit out a salon and that's yeah. where, um, you know, you can incur a lot of costs and a lot of businesses make the mistake, I guess, of investing a lot of money and they'll go out and get a business loan mm. just for the fit out of a, a studio or a salon. And luckily for me, I didn't loan any money. Um, I had my boyfriend at the time, he was a, like in that building kind of industry. So he did the fit out for me and I just paid for the materials. Um, but it was a basic fit out. Like I didn't go... And I didn't make it into the Taj Mahal or anything like that. It, it just had to be what it had to be to, that I could do the job that I needed to do. It wasn't super fancy. Mm. Um, the, you know, you've got to look at it like just because my studio is like super fancy, it's not going to change the amount of clients that walk through the door. They just want to get their makeup done and have a good service. Um, so you've got to be smart like that. So, yeah, I... I didn't have financial support though. Like I, yeah. it's not as if my partner was financially supporting me or anything like mm. that. So it was all on me basically. So yeah. 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 That's, yeah. And yeah, all the, all the more props to you. So obviously coming from the men's magazines and I think, you know, I remember some of those magazines and they're not even really around anymore, but no. men's magazines and the strip clubs to where you are now, there's obviously <laughs> <I know>. been... <laughs> 
<laughs> I know it's, it, oh, it, it really does make for such a funny story because sometimes when I do tell when I am telling like my story, if I'm doing like a masterclass and an artist happens to ask like, Oh, how did you begin? And I'll often <laughs> joke and say, uh, Oh, you know, and I, then I worked in a strip club for a while and um, I'll just casually throw in there, you know, as you know, doing a, a bit of stripping here and there. And, and then I'll kind of like pause for a while and look at all their reactions because they're just like oh my god really? <laughs> but it's a good icebreaker but it, it is a good story um to tell yeah. people but yeah the men's magazine stuff um like it wasn't until I did a master class with Ray Morris um literally gosh I think that was me I don't even know if I had my salon when I did Ray's class but she was the turning point in my career in terms of uh changing my aesthetic I yeah. could never understand how to make my work not look like men's magazine style like full glam mm -hmm. and I guess I've realized that it's not just the makeup but there's so many other things that come into play like you can't do an editorial makeup on a person that is not an editorial model yeah. like that's really important and the styling and the way that the photographer, the way that it's shot. So it's not just the makeup, like it's a lot of those things. So doing her masterclass really finally the penny dropped as to, it's more so what not to do yeah. rather than what to do. So yeah. So I kind of like transitioned into um, away from the, the glam side of things. Um, Cause to be brutally honest, I actually really do feel that that life, that, uh, career path of full glam is very short lived. You can't really go too like high in that um, style of work. Like the men's, a lot of the men's magazines, like you said, are, are shutting down. Like a lot of yeah. publications are shutting down. But um, that, but I feel like there's a, a lot bigger platform for artists that are going down that more fashion editorial or red carpet style makeup yeah. but yeah ray morris was the turning point um oh, for that okay. for me but yeah and i do have to say as well that in my opinion i don't believe that you can be seen unfortunately i don't think that you can be seen as a makeup artist to be dabbling in both like mm. it just doesn't work like vogue is not going to hire you if they see you know your whole portfolio is men's magazine ralph fhm stuff like as a very big example yeah yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And do you think that translates now <laughs> to the Instagram kind of looks as well? You know, I, in my mind, that kind of side of glam has disappeared a little bit. You don't see that much of that anymore, but it's kind of almost been overtaken by this real, you know, the heavy contour in the cut. Creek, yeah, the that's glitter. true, actually. Yeah, it actually has like gone. So, yeah, I guess in having said that, there is still a platform to make money, like in terms oh, of yeah. creating content for brands that like that style of makeup. Um, I do think there is um, but yeah I don't know like I feel like it still is a bit capped at what jobs you would be getting and I feel like it would be majority social media work and content and stuff like that versus like photo shoots and you know magazines and stuff like that yeah um yeah okay so Obviously, you, your, your, um, your career and your business has changed a lot and you've, you've mentioned that, um, that Ray was a big impetus in that change. And so mm. you know, let's talk about that a little bit of how you've navigated, not just that change into a more fashion-oriented um, style of makeup, but also how you've kind of navigated that change through other changes in the industry so things like the rise of social media and how you've moved into education as well yeah i well we can start with education i guess like mm. it's like you can't have um one without the other like i thank social media like heavily for everything that i've done mm. but the master classes the education wouldn't have come along if i didn't have a platform and 
have the reach to showcase my work and the fact that I even do do master classes and that's how they all began like I didn't just decide that I'm going to start doing master classes I was getting asked like if I did master classes via yeah. Facebook and Instagram or it was initially Facebook first um and then obviously once you do one on the gold coast and then the other states like sydney and melbourne will start you know seeing what you're doing because of instagram and then they were asking me to go there so um it's definitely the best like platform that we have available i think at the moment and it's so good for makeup artists um because it's visual mm -hmm. like it's completely visual like you can certainly use it in different businesses um but for what we do it's it's so amazing like and it's mostly free as well so that's lucky like for now anyway it's free who knows what's going to happen <laughs> yeah yeah in the future yeah yep yeah so um but yeah like Okay, Mia, so we were talking about social media and how that has played such an important part um, in your career, in the rise of not only your makeup artist career going all the way back to MySpace, but of course, how important Instagram is to you now. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to know what are your tips, your top tips for those artists who are struggling, you know, that maybe they've just started, maybe they've been around for a while, but they've got like 274 followers on their yeah. Instagram. Yeah, so it all literally comes down to your content. So if you don't have the content to showcase on the platform that we've been given, then you're you're not nothing's gonna going to happen. So you've got to commit to making content, and you can't rely uh, rely on the content that you get from simply the odd client that comes in that you, you might be able to take some pictures of. Um, I rarely do photograph clients, um, to be honest, cause they're kind of, they're not really there for a photo shoot. They're there for, um, a makeup session and they might, might not want to be on your social media, which is fair enough. But so in that event, you've got to make the time to create the content. Um, and that would involve you or what I do is I will literally like approach girls wherever I see them. I don't hesitate in <clears throat> asking them if they've modeled before, would they like to and introduce myself as a makeup artist and that, you know, I often get girl, girls in and create content. Would they be interested in doing that? Blah, blah, blah. Um, so always on the lookout for new fresh faces so that you're not using the same face over and over and over. Um, and just constantly, um, creating imagery, a lot of video work is like the way forward now, more so than stills, mm. um, video content, demonstrating, um, a really quick from start to finish something that you can demonstrate. That's quite, um, impressive, I guess, but in a short time, because everyone's attention span is pretty limited. Um, so it all comes down to making the content and trying to, I guess, collab with other accounts as well that have got bigger followings than you do or even if they don't you're still tapping into their followers by everyone sharing the content whether it's the girl that you've pulled out of a supermarket she's tagging you on her feed her friends see it and then they will start following your account or on a higher level it would be you have shouted out the brands that you're using, that you're targeting in this tutorial or the photo that you've done. Um, and then the best thing would be for the band, brand to give you a shout out. Um, or even other makeup artists, they often will shout out my work. Um, you know, inspiration, I love this picture by me, Connor, blah, blah, blah. That's obviously going on to all their followers as well. So you kind of just piggybacking off other accounts, but none of that happens unless you have the content. So that's where it all comes down to. And content would be, you know, it could be you just doing something on yourself, even if you were limited with time or getting together um, a photo shoot crew or whatever, or even finding a model. It can be as simple as you doing something on your own face. Um, in a video or a picture of your own makeup when you're going to an event or something. 
Um, but you need to be constant with it and you need to mix it up. You need to try and stand out from every other makeup artist and not just produce the same look over and over and over. Um, like this, com this topic of content is, it's endless. Like there's so many um, variables of who your um, subject is. Obviously that matters because that's going to um, really be the difference in capturing someone's attention or not. So, you know, in this whole Instagram world, we're all very um, drawn to beautiful things and beautiful people, which is why brands, every everyone in the whole world business-wise will pull in a model at some point to showcase or sell something. So, mm. and that's because they're pretty and people are drawn to so obviously the better looking your subject is then it's going to be more eye capturing to the person um that is looking at it and it's going to get more engagement so there's that side of it where you could do like the most amazing i always do this like comparison you could do the most amazing makeup on someone that maybe wasn't um as you know supermodel like as versus somebody who is a, an absolute bombshell and you've done a maybe even a really average makeup job on the girl that's ridiculously stunning, but she's the one that's probably going to pull in the more, more engagement versus mm -hmm. the other subject. So there's that, but there's also the comparison of like making your platform relatable. You don't want to pigeonhole yourself as only working with maybe stereo, one stereotype um, of person like models, for instance, or um, you could do like before and afters, like everybody loves transformations. They love to see what you've actually done to get from, you know, they, it's not often when makeup artists will showcase their work that the person viewing it ever sees what the subject was before the makeup artist um, began, unless they did a before and after. So um, doing those makeups, I wouldn't suggest um, getting in a subject that was like, ridiculously good looking because you're not really doing much to enhance that person if they're already like so yeah. stunning so i still if i ever have if i've ever done before and afters um i try to choose somebody that i can see a lot of like i'm looking for a chameleon basically like someone yeah. that's quite plain which a lot of models generally are very plain they can transform themselves into all these different looks which is why they're so versatile but I'm looking for someone that doesn't look like she, I want her to look completely different or a little bit different at least um, once they've had a makeover so that you can tra you can see the transformation and how it's gone down. So it, there's all different ways. You don't just have to go out and hunt for supermodels. Um, but if you look at the accounts that you that a lot of people follow that have got a really high amount of followers, most of the girls on their feed are models. Like yeah. it is what it is. Um, you can try and break the mold and mix it up a little bit, which um, if anyone does follow me on Instagram, like recently, two nights ago, I posted a, a mature aged makeup, but that model was that, well, she wasn't a model. She was just a client, but she was beautiful. And yeah. uh, the makeup really complimented her. And I, I saw that as an opportunity to, um, make my page a little bit more diverse. Like she's not necessarily a supermodel. I mean, she could definitely be a mature age model. She was so stunning, but um, it kind of ticked all the boxes of being diverse. It's still beautiful. Um, and it's, it was different like to see on my feed. So mm. it just, honestly, it, I just, I feel like a lot of makeup artists when I tell them, oh, it's the content. So, you know, you're going to have to use your spare time in your day to actually bring in a model and make the content. They've never entertained that idea. They just think that they're so like thinking with the blinkers on that they think, oh, but my client, some of my clients don't want their pictures taken or some of my clients aren't really suitable for what, I, you know, the, the makeup that I want to showcase or their aesthetic isn't what, I, what I'm trying to showcase on my Instagram page, but they've got to think outside the square and you can make your own content, like I said, on yourself. But it's usually in your own time, unless you're blessed 
to be a working makeup artist, it's doing, for instance, a lot of photo shoots, a lot of e-com mainly where you're working with those models every day of the week because um, fast fashion is shooting every week, those yeah. brands are. And that gives those makeup artists um, content on tap. Those mm. makeup artists are never running low um, on content. It's rare that they would even have to do like, you know, scouting girls in supermarkets and doing content in their own time unless they really wanted to create a look that was completely um, up to their own idea and not a brief that they had to follow from a client. So, um, yeah, so basically it just all comes back to content and you've got to really think outside the square and put effort into creating the content. Because like, uh, I think it was even Ray Morris who said this to me, is that you will get... Um, you might not get paid a lot like from doing a Vogue cover, but it will get you the Gucci campaign. So yeah, yeah. by doing all these little jobs for free or not much money or whatever, or no money, um, which I will continue to do that, like, cause that's my happy place um, mm. is creating what I want to create. Um, but that's what will land you the big jobs because it, is a demonstration of your talent and what you can actually do. If you just sit back and go, Oh, but I only got get booked for corporate work. Like how can I showcase my work with corporate work? Well, mm. you can't. So you really need to put in the effort and um, think outside the square more to create your content. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I remember reading a, a quote. I'm pretty sure it was from Ray once saying that like 65% of the work that she does is unpaid work. So, yeah. you know, that's, and I'm like, yeah, that kind of, for an artist that does a lot of editorial, you know, and yeah. I always get people saying to me, how can I get all this editorial work? And I'm like, you know, that doesn't pay, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so. But it does lead to the paid work. Though, exactly, yeah. It makes you look um, busy as well. Like if you're seen to be doing all these um, photo shoots, whether it was a test or whatever, nobody knows that it wasn't paid. Mm. Like if we didn't. Yep. No, if Ray didn't say make that statement, we would assume that everything that, uh, and especially the general consumer and someone that's not in the industry, yeah. would look on an artist page and they would never even know what the term TFP meant. Exactly. Um, and they would just assume that that makeup artist was so busy, no one knows that you didn't have to get paid, that you didn't get paid, or no one has to know that you didn't get paid for that job or whatever, but it creates buzz amongst like your general followers, but it also creates buzz amongst other artists as well because we we don't know what's what the other artist is doing were they paid were they not but it makes them look busy and people want they're drawn to like when they're i'm talking about the consumers they're drawn to the person that's killing it allegedly exactly yeah yeah, yeah. it's all smoke and mirrors so yeah yeah and that's another thing that i say you know sometimes you'll get paid in money sometimes you get paid in other things like you might get paid in photos of course tfp yeah. but you might get paid in um, connections, you know, new people that you can network yeah. with. That if you go out and do a test shoot, for example, and you work with a great photographer or a great stylist, they might be impressed with your work and then get you in on a paid shoot, you know. Yeah, after. yeah exactly. And I mean, like I say to so many makeup artists and they're like, oh, but how do you get in with photographers? Like they, they only use like who they use and they, they won't like even entertain using me or whatever. Um, and I joke with them, well, unless she's about to have an accident, <laughs> unless you're about to throw her down the stairs, yeah. um, you take that photographer a paid client. Yeah. Like, and that's yeah. your foot in the door. Like if you can say, hey, I've got this, um, you know, a friend of mine is a designer. She wants to shoot her collection. I'm going to be the makeup artist. And that's your introduction. You've not only given that photographer money because mm -hmm. it's a paid client, but you've also forced yourself um, in their <laughs> face and hopefully you guys like connect because it's not only your work when you're working with photographers that'll get you across the line to get future jobs. It's the um, dynamics of the relationship or the rapport that you have or the lack of, because no one wants to have a punish person on set. Like mm. if you're not getting on, you're not going, that photographer is not going to hire you. And, it is usually the photographer that is kind of at the top of the pecking order in terms of casting like makeup artists because they want to know, uh, yes, I've worked with her or him before and I am satisfied that the work is, you know, not going to see me sitting 
till midnight in Photoshop mm. fixing all of this mess of makeup. So plus they get on, they eventually become friends and, and that's how it all works. So, but back to the original point is that it creates um, busyness, the illusion of busyness. Um, and, and then, yeah, obviously if you are doing a test, you get the images um, that demonstrate what you can do, which again is important because just because you can do it, if people don't see you doing it, you can't do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you need to really be pushing the the boundaries and showing the world like what you can do, and not just another bronze, gold, smoky eye or whatever. But you need to really demonstrate like your actual talents, what you're capable of doing, because you never yeah. know what like a brief might be. Mm. Like, you know, and you could use Becca as an example. Like, no one's going to come and hire me for um, body painting work. Mm. Well, A, I don't do it. But do you see me do it? Even if I did it, like, I'd have to be seen to be doing it. Of course, they're going to go for the artist that does that. That's mm. their doing any of that. They just assume that you can't. So, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that's, that would be my advice. It's not, it's not going to be a quick um, rise to getting followers these days, unfortunately, because they say now that if you haven't grown your following organically by now, because of all the um, implementation of like the bots and, um, you know, people buying followers and stuff like that, like it's going to be virtually impossible to grow an organic following, mm. uh, keep up with all of that. So yeah. yeah. But, you know, there are micro influencers obviously out there that brands are more looking to collab with um, that are just because they don't have 100,000 followers. I'm talking maybe someone that's got maybe 10,000 followers, that their engagement is high. Their mm. viewers actually listen and take on board what they say and believe them because they're authentic. Um, so they're kind of more valuable than somebody that's got like, you know, 200K majority of the um, following is men because mm. of whatever content they're posting and a beauty brand um, is not, they're not interested in that. Like yeah. that's, they look at the stats when hiring a makeup artist on Instagram, all the insights, how, you know, where your demographic is, are they male? Are they female? Where are they based? Otherwise mm. it's irrelevant. So all yeah. of that kind of has to be taken into account as well. Yeah. 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 So where to from here for you, Mia? You know, you, you're traveling around the world, educating, living, yes. the, living the jet set lifestyle or I the uh, jet lag lifestyle. Yeah, well, be careful what you wish for because literally I think last year was when all my international stuff started and I was saying, I want to travel more. Like then literally I have been flying most weeks. Like I can say that I'm, if I'm back for more than three weeks, that's like, a good run mm -hmm. so I have been flying a lot but in terms of where to next I am probably why well, I am closing my studio that I've had for 12 years now at yeah. the end of this year because I am traveling so much I'm just going to really focus on um, I love educating so I will continue to do my master classes and really focusing on overseas more yeah. so as mm -hmm. well um, I did toy with the idea of moving to America um, just because there's so much work there and almost I would say maybe a higher caliber of work. Like everyone is there, like all yeah. the big brand and celebrities and whatever. But I've always been one to kind of choose lifestyle over my work. So yep. I've, I've kind of put that on the back burner for now. Um, I am working on a product at the moment which i won't say too much about what it is until it actually launches um but i'm going to go down that path of developing a product um, awesome. because i can't work like this forever <laughs> like i need to this is something that makeup artists all need to consider is that what what are you going to do for your future like majority of them wouldn't be paying superannuation like yeah. i guarantee it mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. unless you do have a, a financial support around you like what are you going to do <laughs> like you know how long do you want to keep working like this and especially if you haven't put money into your super and stuff like that so that's why 
I'm looking at, at different avenues that I can make money in my sleep, preferably because obviously our income is so capped because we're in a service-based industry. Mm. And I do find it so difficult to have makeup artists that subcontract because yeah. I find that most makeup artists eventually want to go out and do their own thing. Whereas mm. it's so different with hairdressers. They would happily like rent a chair or be employed for the rest of their lives doing hairdressing in salon. Um, but makeup artistry is different. Everyone's a little bit more entrepreneurial and they want to go out and make a name for themselves. So I, unless you are like having staff, I think it, your income can be quite capped as a makeup artist if it's just all on you and the amount of hours you can do in the day. So yeah, yeah so I'm working on that. And yeah, that's about, I think that'll be enough to keep me... <laughs> Very busy. <laughs> Keep you going, yeah. Yeah. So, um, and I've had a lot of questions about um, when your um, your next masterclasses are going to be. We haven't seen you in Brisbane for quite a while. No, I haven't done a Queensland masterclass um, this year, or I think maybe I did a Gold Coast masterclass maybe last year. I can't remember, but. To be honest, it's really strange. Like the Gold Coast, even I live on the Gold Coast, if anyone doesn't know that. Um, but the Gold Coast is the weakest link for me. Mm. <laughs> it's my weakest city. Um, I think maybe because I started in the Gold Coast doing my masterclasses and I ran them to death that I've probably captured a lot of the makeup artists already on the Gold Coast. And if I haven't, they've come to my other seminars where I've done like beauty expo and trade shows and stuff like that. Or they've watched my online stuff with the secret box. Um, so I will do one. I, I keep saying that I will, but I'm next year. I need to set down my schedule basically again. Um, Melbourne's my top city, um, for masterclasses and education. So mm -hmm. I am putting on, I've got two more masterclasses left this year. So i go to Townsville literally next week. Um, I believe it's the 19th and the 20th. I'm running my bridal masterclass on the 19th where I do two demos. It's a hands-on masterclass. It's intimate. It's caps at 12 people and you have to bring your model and your kit and so forth. But my demos are focused on um, not just the bride, but also mature makeup. So for mother of the bride, mm. which is you know relevant to that image that I posted the other night, that lady was 54. Um, and the other class that I run is my content creator masterclass, um, which obviously is what we've just been talking about creating the content, but it's easy for me to just to say, Oh yeah, you need to go and make some content. But to do this class, it's obviously the hands-on element and I will be guiding. It's my newest class basically. Yeah. So I haven't taken it to Perth yet. I have ran it in um, Adelaide and Melbourne and Sydney. Um, but basically it's me creating content um, showing you how I do it and strategies that I use and how I photograph the work, which is so important. Because so important. That is the biggest letdown for a makeup artist that mm. doesn't have an eye for that as well. Yeah. And it's yeah. not something that is, you can just be like, oh yes, I have an eye for photography or an eye for detail or whatever. That's something that is acquired like over quite a long time, I feel. Um, so it focuses on that how I do editing of my pictures, the styling, all of the elements that go into creating an image and how I target brands to obviously repost my work to grow my following. So mm. that's I've got that in Townsville and then I go to Melbourne. Um, on the 24th, I'm, I've just put on a random really quick... Um, it's a look and learn only. It's on a Sunday, so it's on the 24th of November in St Kilda. Um, it's two looks that I'm demonstrating. So it's like four hours from 1 PM till 5 PM. Um, I haven't decided on the looks yet, but they would be generally like obviously of my style, like more red carpety kind of mm. stuff. And then that's wrapped up this year. And then I'm, um, I'll have to set down my schedule. I'm looking at coming to Perth actually in January, cause I've got to do a wedding at the Margaret river on the 18th of January. So I'm going to tag a Perth trip. Um, I'm in that Perth. Facebook um, group so everyone's expressed a lot of interest there for me to come to Perth because I didn't do Perth this year either so mm. um, I'll go I'll probably do Perth in January like late January I was concerned it was going to be 
maybe a bit close to after Christmas, but everyone seems keen. So I'll do Perth and I'll do Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, and I will do a, um, a Queensland one, most likely on the Gold Coast because I live here. Um, yeah. And then my international stuff. So I'm going to do a South American tour. I'm going to go back to Lima. Um, I'll do Argentina as well. I'll go back to Croatia. I'll go back to America. I'll do Miami swim week and do some masterclasses in America as well. And, um, yeah, just spend my life on a plane. <laughs> awesome. 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 Yeah. Well, it's definitely, um, a busy schedule and, yes. you know, I think it's, it's, um, you know, something, your career is something that a lot of artists can look and aspire to. And, you know, I want to really take this opportunity to thank you for being so open and honest with all of your advice today. Yes, um, and I think it's been really great that we can see that, you know, it's not just kind of like you arrive at that sort of a career, you know. So thank you for being really honest yeah. about what it was yeah. like starting out too. And the yeah. amount of hard work and persistence and patient yeah, that it actually it's takes. not going to fall into your lap not and especially not now because I feel like the makeup industry is so saturated like mm. it's like personal trainers and makeup artists they're like everywhere everyone yeah. wants to be one of those um, yeah. so it's become extremely competitive um, but one thing that I would say is to definitely get on a counter like if you are a makeup artist starting out and definitely get some counter experience under your belt because that's um that's invaluable because you're just pumping out they make you work so fast that you mm. increase your speed and you just get to work on so many different faces so you just get so much practice um with all you know if, especially if you're in mecca and sephora you get to play mm. with all of the different brands that are out all the new products that have just dropped so your product knowledge is like second to none so i definitely recommend that but um yes yeah. And is there anything else that you would like to add? I guess the other thing I didn't mention was um, I have started that whole <laughs> shit Connie says. Yeah, hashtag, yeah, yeah. Um, that I have changed my strategy with my captions. Like you aren't really utilizing your full potential on Instagram if you're just writing in the caption makeup on Mary this week. And yeah. I used an hourglass lipstick, like who cares? So it's not really engaging. So I've been doing that and obviously using that hashtag. Um, just, you know, it's funny, I guess. Maybe it's not appropriate, <laughs> but I'm not an appropriate person. So, um, but it was quite funny. Like when I've been setting down the, the little mini challenges um, and I know that you, you participated in that when I was encouraging everybody to get on Insta story and mm. talk more to camera, even if it was for the first time um hearing everyone all over the world in their different accents yeah <laughs> say the hashtag shit connie says you know <laughs> like there was indian accents and british and like people from ireland and it was just so funny to like it was super cute to to hear them all say, and probably makeup artists that would never even swear in their lives and they were still <laughs> getting on board saying it so i have been kind of like um toying with the idea of doing a blog um, which would like connect into my Instagram because those captions are like a mini blog post, I guess. Mm, so mm. I've tried to be um, educational, um, yeah, yeah. which is far more engaging than just like, like I said earlier, just makeup on Mary or whatever. Um, and the other thing I guess that I haven't mentioned is that the aim of the game, because remember that we don't own anything on Instagram or mm. Facebook. So you have built up all of these followers and at, at some point if Instagram just decided to pull the pin, yeah. you're done. Like that's yeah. your whole network gone. So obviously the aim of the game is to be directing your um, followers onto your own platform, mm. whether it's gathering emails um, to be on a mailing list so that you've got some kind of your own database there. Um and eventually, like, you're kind of, like, enticing them over, gaining their trust by educating them and being completely transparent with them. But ultimately, it's hopefully you have a database that you're going to be selling something to them. Um, yeah. yeah. Whether it's your makeup services or whatever, masterclasses or whatever. So I think that's um, definitely something that needs to be, like, addressed. And, and that's something that I teach all the time. You know, my students who are watching this will know that, you know, I always say, get them off 
social media yes get them yeah, onto your so, own yeah, yeah mainly i might do a yep. blog i don't know it's committing a lot to you know sit down it's and a lot that. of work yeah. yeah yeah i've written a blog and post every week this year and it is it's a lot yeah, of work yeah it is and just coming up with the new like what are, what are we talking about this week <laughs> like I don't know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But yeah, there's endless topics. So um, we are pretty lucky in that. So I, I love teaching and I love um, sharing like the stuff, mm. the knowledge that I have had to learn the hard way because yeah. no one shared yeah. everything with me has been, um, yeah, I, I enjoy kind of like making a makeup artist have a light bulb moment of, ah, oh, okay, I get it now. Like when I'm teaching or whatever, showing them a different way. And it's just a nice, like rewarding feeling. So yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe I'll do a blog. We'll see. Well, well we will look forward to that. I, I can yeah. just see it now. The banner shit Connie says. <laughs> I know. I don't know if, if, if I should change the name, but I I've been using that hashtag for so long. Cause that whole hashtag, people are probably like, why is she even using that hashtag? But, <laughs> That hashtag came about because do you remember ages ago, like there was these little videos of like shit mum says and shit nan yeah. says. They, they were like YouTube funny videos. Yeah. And I've always just, anytime there's been like a press article or a write up in a magazine about me, I've always like captioned it like more of shit Connie says in like new <laughs> idea or whatever. So I don't know. It's I feel like it's original and maybe a little bit um, inappropriate, but I I hope that people can see the funny side, you know, and not take it too seriously. I think so. Yeah. 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 So do we have awesome. any questions? Or no more questions around? have come through. So I think we will thank you so very much for your time, and My pleasure. Um, we will wrap up here. So. Um, now, just before we go, let everybody know if if they don't already where they can find you online. Put the the link on. in yep. the box down the here, down below. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's just at Mia Connor is my main Instagram page, but I've also got my bridal one that I've opened like in the last couple of months. Um, that is, uh, what is it? It's uh, Mia Connor Bridal. Mm -hmm. So that's where I'm kind of showcasing like my, my actual clients, not just my models yep. and focusing on that, like kind of bridal red carpet event makeup. So that's your everyday woman clientele. Um, mm -hmm. I'm trying to put up, put up images in that, that are just completely raw and untouched, like no editing, just to be completely transparent about this is what the makeup looked like on the day yep. um, and keep it separate from my, um, my actual main Mia Connor page. Yep. Yeah. And yeah, is Instagram, things. sorry, is Instagram the best place for people to keep up to date with your masterclasses yes. and what's coming? Yes, yes. So you can um, go to my website and you can subscribe to my newsletter so that when I do send like a MailChimp newsletter blast, you'll get the, de the dates on there. But I always have all my travel dates in my bio on Instagram. So, mm -hmm. um, and you can book masterclasses and appointments like simply by clicking on the book button on my Instagram page. That's like something that's been integrated through my online booking system. So all the information about my masterclasses is within that online service. So you just simply click on book and you're either selecting to book a class and then you can hit more info which will give you all the information about where it is and what to bring and how much and whatever and you can book everything online so it makes it really easy but yeah instagram would be um the main place where most of my content is up so i need a new website so <laughs> don't look too closely on there but definitely subscribe um to the newsletter so that you do because even though i write all the dates in the bio people just they miss it yeah, so I'll and go, I'll go we're always Melbourne at the mercy then, of the algorithm, you know? Yeah, and I'll go to Melbourne and then I'll have messages saying, when when are you coming to Melbourne? And I'm like, I was mm. just there last week. And they're yeah. like, oh, we didn't even know. So mm. if you, yeah, keep up to date probably just by registering your email address in the um, newsletter on my website, which is miaconnor.com. And um, yeah, I'll see you in class. Awesome. Okay, well, thank you so much, Mia. Really appreciate you being my here. Pleasure. Wow, that was a really incredible interview. We are so grateful to Mia for sharing all of her knowledge with us today. If you enjoyed this video and you'd love to see more interviews with amazing makeup artists, then make sure that you subscribe to my channel and click the bell so that you will get notified next time I have another amazing makeup artist to share their knowledge with you all. 
Thanks so much for watching and bye for now.